Okay. Next up, we have uh, Phil Theorem from Delta XML. Please take it away. Okay, good morning everyone. No, sorry about the, the delay. Uh, so yes, I'm Phil Firon. I work for Delta XML, uh, but the, the subject of this talk, Streamlining XML Authoring Workflows, is really a blend of um, experience with Delta XML, but previous experience from working at Saxonica on the Saxon CE project, and also probably uh, 10 years prior to, uh, prior to that, or where I was working on document management systems for the UK uh, government. So, um, first of all, a bit of context, really, about um, XML authoring workflows. Um, so I'm going to go through uh, why, why the workflow is important, um, the different types of workflow. Then I'm going to kind of look at other industries and how they deal with workflow problems. And then I'm going to go on to a uh, demonstration of one particular way of solving workflow problems. So uh, the purpose of a workflow, why do we do it? Well, uh, with publishing or with, with authoring documents on the way towards uh, a published solution, um, one of the key priorities is to allow a number of people to work together to make a better document. Um, and so you're improving quality, ensuring that, that the style of the document is consistent, you're checking for correctness. But there, depending on the type of document you're talking about, there'll be a number of other concerns as well that you need to address. So types of workflow. Um, well, from, from this perspective, there, there are two key types I want to talk about. Uh, the sequential workflow, where you have an editing chain and you have an original document that is submitted to perhaps the, the first reviewer in the editing chain, Anna in this case, and she will um, make her revisions to that original document and then pass them on to the next person in the chain and so on. And then you end up, once David has finished his revisions, you end up with a new document that you can then baseline. Concurrent workflow is really the converse of this. You start off with the original document, but then you uh, submit that to all your reviewers at the same time, and you ask them to make their revisions. Um, but the key part to concurrent working is this big triangle here, uh, the merge. You've got this problem at the end where you've got all these revisions uh, that you need to coalesce back into a single document uh, that keeps all your reviewers happy, and but is also consistent with your uh, company policy. Um, one thing to point out really is that even though I've shown these as two separate types, in the real world uh, it's, there's a lot of grey areas in between and you will find that in a concurrent working that Ben, Chris and David might actually be working in a semi-sequential way but the thing is you don't know that. Likewise in a sequential workflow uh, it might be that Ben and David talk to each other um, so it's really just to point out that, uh, that even though it, it's convenient to look at these as two separate types, but in the real world means that you will see both of these uh, types happening. Well, that's, that's my experience at least. Um, before looking at the specific problem with XML authoring, it, it's useful to look elsewhere, other industries, who's having to manage revisions to their source and how are they managing it? And a natural place for us to look as software developers is to look at our own industry. Um, and we don't have to look very far before we see a, a wealth of solutions out there, uh, version control systems that deal very effectively with the life cycle of the, the software source. Um, so what can we use from this? Um, well, we can certainly borrow some of the high-level principles that are used there. We, we can understand that people, um, you know, sometimes it's essential to deal with a product 
or two products in parallel and then join that information back together again. Um, but when we look a bit closer at the different characteristics between uh, general source code and XML documents, this is where we start to actually see uh, the, the differences and the fact that the, the characteristics are so different and also the people working with that source have got such different skill sets that it, it's not always a good idea to um, look too far at the specific tools themselves, but certainly the general principles carry through. So now it's time just to look at the XML authoring industry and uh, see what we've got here already. Microsoft Word has been mentioned a few times already by other speakers, so it gets a look in here, even though it isn't specifically an XML authoring tool. It's what um, quite a lot of authors are used to, and it's worth looking at the way they try to uh, manage revisions to documents. So um, I've also got Oxygen XML here as a good example of an XML specific authoring tool. But both um, manage changes normally through a, a track change principle. But this is reinforcing a sequential workflow because each author will switch on track changes, make their changes, and then uh, the next author will carry on and make their changes in track changes mode. Um, the tools do allow you to um, register who made those changes, but they're very restricted because of the sequential flow, and so you can't, have, you can't record nested information about changes. Um, but that's perfectly okay, because that's not their purpose. They are sequential uh, tools in, in that sense. So, um, now to talk about the, the project that I've been working on for some time now, uh, XML Flow. So this is a proof of concept, which started off really as a, a user interface design study. Um, because I was looking at the problem of how, with concurrent workflows, you know I was talk pointing at that big triangle that was the problem, the, the merge part of the concurrent workflow process. Well, how do we resolve that and make sure that that isn't the sticking point? Um, and so it was to look at user interfaces that help with that, to prove that at a lower level, the, the comparison technologies that are available that can combine all of those differences back into a single document, that those work properly. Um, to also, the idea for the proof of concept for, was for most of the technology to work client side. It just made things uh, a lot more rapid in development and it also gave more flexibility if there were changes in, in the design. And I'm also very keen to explore uh, web technologies um, and that particularly comes from my experience with uh, Saxonica working on the Saxon CE processor. All right, this is demo time. So I will switch to the browser. Uh, I've got to remember I've got no trackpad. So this is XML Flow, a simple web application. Uh, and it's designed using a plain bootstrap CSS. So the key point for actually the the more cosmetic parts of the user interface design is just to make sure that they don't become a distraction. It's not to produce perfect colors or anything, but just so that we don't get distracted by them. Um, it's a mobile-first design, but that, again, it's really for pragmatic reasons. It's a lot easier to build something for a mobile device like an iPad and then scale things up to work uh, with the desktop later on. Um, I'm going to put this in full screen mode. And so you can see there are some similarities uh, already with the screenshots I was showing of Word and Oxygen. We have a main document view, and then we have a panel that lists the, the changes. Uh, but what I'm going to do here is I'm going to um, go back to this scenario in the concurrent workflow, where I've got an original document that I've submitted to Anne, Ben, Chris, and David. And they've actually... Uh, 
uh, made their revisions to the original document and they've sent them back to me. So I now need to go to my file system. <coughs> And I need to take their revision, revised documents, but also I've got to include the original document that I sent. And I drag them all into the files panel of XML Flow. Uh, the next part in the stage is to make sure that the original document is at the top of this list, because this has got a special place in, in the comparison solution. So now that's done, all that's remaining before I start the merge is to give these useful um, names so that I can refer to them rather than the long file names. So, Ben, Chris, and David. Now I can start the merge. Now, this is going to take some time, but that's good because it gives me time to talk. Um, we will see in the left-hand side that there's a progress bar that's showing as each document is being compared and merged. These are notifications that are actually being sent back from the server well, I've still got a continuous HTTP connection. So that's very useful. In fact, that was quicker than I was expecting because I hadn't, normally I would have warmed up this. So, because the second merge will always be quicker than the first merge on this. Okay, so th that is the result of the comparison. Let's have a look and see what we have here. So we've got a single document that is uh, labeled in the, change pa in the files panel as a working merge. Uh, so this is all of those documents combined back into a single document. And uh, I should mention here that this is a DITA document that uh, we're working with. And one of the key parts of this is that a DITA document really you want to keep as a valid DITA document for as much as of possible as the life cycle. But at this particular time, what we've done is we've embedded annotations within that DITA XML to describe what the differences are between the original document and the, the revisions by Anna, Ben, Chris, and David. Um, so now we've got that document, uh, we can start to get a feel for who's been doing what to, to this document. And so this is very important uh, when, when you're taking uh, inputs from a lot of different authors who um, have got different roles in the review process. You want to understand what they've been doing to the document at a high level before you dig in just to make sure that uh, there's some uh, consistency there with company policy, whatever. Um, so let's have a look and see what Anna's been doing. So if I just click on Anna, um, we can make out here, in fact, what I'll do, perhaps it's a bit small at the back, so I'll just increase the size of the document view. So we can see the changes that Anna's been doing. Um, there's a greeny blue background, really, where she's been making additions, and a red background for her deletions. Uh, so down there, and the word Delta XML up there. Uh, likewise, we could have uh, go for uh, Ben and see his changes. Um, and the other way that we can get a feel for things is just by clicking on parts of the document. And then we will see that in the list of uh, our, our reviewers at the top, uh, it underlines who's been associated with that change and also the, the underlying colour, the green, tells us that uh, they've been adding that. Um, th and the change is also highlighted in the change list and there's an icon that gives an indication about the change type. Uh, and there are some subtleties there. I use square borders to indicate changes to elements and rounded borders to indicate changes to uh, are just text nodes. So um, we've got a good feel for, for the changes that people have been uh, making, but now as the kind of uh, person responsible for the final uh, baseline of the document, I need to go through and accept or reject changes. So to do this, I'm going to uh, work as if I were using an iPad, even though I'm not. Um, but there, there are also keyboard shortcuts that I could be using, but it's probably easier with the screen to see uh, where I'm going here. So first of all, I'm going to go into accept mode and have a look at accepting some of those changes. I'll take Ben off so I'm not highlighting Ben's changes. So the first change I come to is a text addition. 
I've accepted that. And so therefore the, the border for that text edition has been removed and there's a highlight in the change list to say that that change has been accepted. And the key point here is to, that these are one-touch operations. You're using, say, an iPad and, and you can just go quickly through and accept those changes that, that you want. Um, so this next change is an um, element addition. So if I click on that, it's accepted that. Um, but one thing to notice here, and this goes back to what I was talking about earlier, is that in a concurrent workflow, you can't guarantee that people aren't um, cooperating behind the scenes. So it looks here like Anna, Ben and Chris decided, perhaps independently, perhaps together, to add a, a section to this uh, topic. Now, I should just say that a, a way to get more information about the actual element structure is if I press this button here, um, it actually gives me, in very faint text, it will give the X paths for each of the, the top level parts of the, the document structure. Um, so I can see that, um, well, I can see that we're inside the first introduction and the preliminaries is a modification and it's a title. It doesn't actually tell me that it's a section, but I can infer that from my knowledge of uh, DITA. And so if I look at that particular change, uh, it's a modification, and I've actually clicked on preliminaries, and so th that means that I've accepted Ben's idea for the title. But I could, if I change my mind, I can select that again and select introduction instead. So any action you take, you can undo that action just by repeating it. So um, I will try and speed things up a bit here by uh, quickly going through. So these are mutually exclusive uh, changes here. And this is one difference between um, a sequential comparison and um, <coughs> what we call a common ancestor comparison, where we, we have got that original document to go back to. So we, as well as having addition and deletion change types, we've also got a modification. And so um, we can see that the original uh, content was editors and it's been modified by Ben to reviewers. Um, but I'll quickly go through and accept some of these other changes. Now, here we can see a three-way change. Um, so this is a conflicting change. Again, something that you don't get in a traditional uh, sequential workflow, but something you have to deal with. So content management was misspelt in the original. Um, if I select that, um, that was the spelling correction made by Anna, Ben, and Chris. Um, David have a, had a different idea, and his idea was to call it a document management system. So actually, let's go back and call it a document management system. But that means also that I have to select the abbreviation properly there as well. And that's useful in that it shows that there are a lot of subtle dependencies between different parts of a document that it will be hard for any automated merge to, to understand and, and correct. Okay. Um, so now I want to um, accept that addition. But with the rejected elements, uh, sorry, with deleted elements, I'm going to reject them just so that they don't, if I accepted them, they would just disappear with a placeholder left in their place. But um, if I reject them, the border's removed, but a horizontal bar, uh, sorry, a vertical bar, uh, shows that that was actually deleted by at least one of the reviewers. And I can do the same there for that uh, list item. And so now if I go through and make sure that uh, these other changes are accepted. So the key thing here is to go through and make sure that um, all the changes have either been accepted or rejected. So I'm looking to make sure that all the, those, uh, the left-hand side, the bar on the left-hand side has got colors to show uh, the approval decisions have been made. Um, so that's the content side of things, but there may have been attribute changes, so let's look at the attribute change list by clicking on that tab, and I can see that a couple of ID attributes have been added, so I'll accept that, and a lang attribute has been modified, and I'll accept Anna's change to that attribute. So that's it. Um, if I just go back to the files panel, 
Hopefully, we've got the working merge in a state that is ready to produce a new baseline. But we have to remember that this has got all the embedded information about uh, those changes, and so it's not suitable at the moment to go on through something like the Ditter Open Toolkit to produce PDFs, uh, because they would not recognize all those additional annotations. So I have to press this uh, finalize button here. And so uh, that produces a finalized DITA document that is ready for further processing. Um, all that's left for me to do now is to make sure that that is usable, so I can use the, the cloud for this. And so I just need to say, store this on the cloud, give me a unique UR, URL for that. And likewise, I'll collect the working merge and store that on the cloud. Um, so now um, we've moved, I'll go back to the uh, presentation to underline what we've done. So uh, what have we done in the demo? Uh, we took those uh, revisions made by Anna, Ben, Chris and David, we took and the original document, we dragged and dropped them into XML flow, uh, we sorted them and uh, labelled them to give them meaningful short names. Uh, then we went through the approval process, accepting and rejecting changes. Uh, so then we ended up with a finalised working merge and we've uh, stored that because and that is important. It also goes back to my work that I've done with the National Archive where you always need a formal record of, of changes that have been made to documents that are a, a matter of record. And so you, people want to know why, why things have changed. And this kind of uh, workflow allows you to um, keep track of when documents changed and who made those changes. Um, so it's important to, to store the working merge, um, but also the finalised merge is required for the, for the next step in your workflow. It might be that you have to go through another cycle of revision and review uh, because uh, workflows can be quite protracted. Um, this is the good bit, so hopefully I've got a bit of time for this. Um, the actual the design for XML flow. Uh, so as I said earlier, it's a client-side application predominantly, so the vast majority of the code is running in the browser, and you won't be surprised to learn that it's XSLT that is running in the browser. Uh, so that's responding to user events, and that's in, in reaction to that, those uh, events get passed on um, in certain cases to the web application server, but only actually in the case where it's, uh, you want to actually do the merge, so that's when I press the merge button, and uh, when you actually want to store any of those documents that you have in the, in the files panel, you just select them and press store, and that gets sent back. Um, and that's the technologies used here. Um, it's a straightforward, HTTP post that is used to send the XML uh, back through, but I'm also making use of web sockets, uh, which works actually very well just using standard APIs so that notifications can be sent back from the web application server even while that HTTP connection is still being held. Um, so this probably helps to explain why XSLT was probably a good idea for uh, the, the client-side code, um, because this is actually what is sent back from the Delta XML uh, merge component. Um, so it's the DITA document, but there are a lot of annotations here to describe uh, how the original document uh, differs from tho those revisions. And just to take an example here, um, we can see that the, the term content management that was misspelt in the original document, so therefore, uh, in the XML here, we, there's a delta v2 attribute with just a value of base to tell us that that was the original version. But then the following text element, named text, um, has got a delta v2 attribute saying Anna equals Ben equals Chris. In this case, equals is just that acting as a separator, but it's saying that that is who made those changes. Um, 
So even though this looks complicated here, it is optimized for processing in a pipeline because a lot of optimization actually happens before this, uh, what we call a delta V2, is actually sent back. Um, so it's actually in uh, its fa fairly raw form, but it doesn't take too much analysis to actually f convert that information into information where you're characterizing things as being additions, deletions, modifications or even identifying where conflicts lie. Um, and the XSLT expressions can be used uh, very effectively for that, because we're doing a um, set comparison a lot of the time in the delta V2, where we're breaking this up and, and comparing which um, owners of that change um, overlap with owners of another change higher up, and that kind of thing. Um, so that was the, the response from the merge component that we were looking at just now. This is what happens when you serialize the working merge. And all those changes that are highlighted in the... Okay. All the changes that were highlighted in the change list are shown, are embedded back into the merge document. Uh, and so that's how it's stored. And therefore, you have a record of those changes. It's also added descriptions for those changes. Um, I've been through most of the technologies that were used here, but here's a summary. And conclusions. Um, concurrent working adds flexibility. Um, even if it doesn't appear that a publisher is using concurrent workflow, um, it, the chances are um, that there is some concurrency happening beneath the seams, but um, it will be um, perhaps via email or something. And it's actually, in the formal document process, it's nice to have a record of that. Um, anyway, document, mer uh, document merge solutions are, are out there. I use the, the data merge component from Delta XML. Um, there's a more generic component now just for general XML. Um, so that, that just works. Um, what is needed is that additional layer on top to provide something that is are useful to the end user. And hopefully here I've been able to prove that that additional layer is indeed possible. Not only that, it actually doesn't take uh, a great deal of effort. And lastly, XML in the browser is alive and well. Um, XSLT technologies work extremely effectively there. And um, yeah, the, the future is bright, I would say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Phil. We have time for one or two questions. Uh, can you add in your own modification as well? Because in the example you just showed, for instance, there was a CMS becoming DMS, and in the next line it was mentioned as CMS. Right, yes. Um, that's a good question, and a, a, a deliberate decision was made here to, to prevent that. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is because I come from the uh, environment working on large projects where we needed always a formal record of uh, when changes are made, um, that would be another uh, stage in the life cycle of that document, those corrections, because they're, they're almost inevitable. Um, but it's, it's helpful um, to uh, concentrate on one part of the process at a time when things get very formal like that. It also simplifies development. Um, data comments are actually part of the schema. You can add comments any time you like. They are normally hidden, but if you, there is a reveal button you can press, and that will reveal those comments in line. I've got a question from Mark. Um, no, uh, but I can reassure you that uh, with large documents, you will have severe problems with the current design. Um, but I can... <laughs> uh, just because... Um, the way things are being loaded um, in one single step on the client. But I've done other um, solutions that are client-based where I use the same tricks that uh, JavaScript solutions use, where it's a progressive rendering allows you to uh, uh, just show the first page that the user can see and the rest can be done in the background. Um, and that, that works successfully in the past. And I so no, see no reason why it can't scale that way for something like that. 
I, I think it's cool that you're using web sockets, but that's by the way. That's a technology that needs to be used more and more. Absolutely. Okay, so we have uh, morning coffee now. So thank you, thank you, Phil.